cyclical nature of financial markets gives confidence to analysts. We all know when we hit bear territory, it'll only last so long before we start seeing bullish sentiments start to filter through. The big question is when. Russell Napier thinks by analysing the Wall Street Journal, one can determine when the recovery will kick in. Well, Russell, let's start with why the Wall Street Journal? Why did you choose this media? I think all stock markets are the same, so I think it wouldn't really matter which stock market you were looking at. Particularly the Wall Street Journal, this book was written uh, over 10 years ago, uh, and it had to analyse 16 months of Wall Street Journal articles, and they were available digitally, and the Financial Times wasn't. So you looked at the four great market bottoms and then the articles either side of these for two months. What were your main findings? Because I'm looking at very extreme times, so this is not a normal period. These equity markets have become extremely cheap. And the main finding is they get extremely cheap because we believe in deflation. I think the best way to look at that as a stock, uh, a stock market investor is to call it uh, falling cash flows. So they associate it with a period of falling cash flows, which get particularly vicious in a deflation. And in that scenario, the equity prices can fall a long way because we begin to question whether they'll be able to meet all their liabilities, whether there's any equity in the company at all. And for people who've lived through 2009, obviously you find that that is exactly what happens. Will this company actually be here by Christmas? And when you get speculation like that coming along, then clearly equities can get very, very cheap. And is there one defining signal that says that we're coming into bear territory? The simple answer to that is no. Where we stand today with inflation so low, it's anything that would push that inflation rate below zero. I think that's the thing that will bring equity markets down quite quickly because we're, there's a huge faith in central bankers to create inflation, to create higher nominal GDP growth, to get higher corporate cash flows. After six years of extreme effort and monetary uh, excessive activity, anything that undermines that I think would be the, the top for equities, equity markets. So what sort of lessons should we really take away from this? Can we learn from past mistakes? We absolutely can. We do in any other discipline. I mean, you know, Madame Curie killed herself doing her particular experiment. Nobody does that today. So clearly the scientists manage to learn things and they learn regularly. We don't. Uh, there are good reasons why we don't learn. I mean, there's a human greed, human fear, human emotion. Uh, but we can learn more than we do today. A great intellectual cul-de-sac we've been charging up to believe that all of this stuff can be determined by an equation uh, is where we've gone so dreadfully wrong. So the wonderful thing about digitalization is that we can now look back, we can see what people were thinking at the time because it is all there in the contemporary press. So I think from contemporary opinion, there's a lot to be learned. So this is a whole new field of stock market investigation. You might want to call it uh, financial archaeology. Uh, what we can now embark upon. Before it was sitting in a basement reading microfiche. Today you can do it from the luxury of your home. Well, let's look at the events of today. And it does sort of feel like the downturn is taking forever to turn the other way. Why do you think this is? It is because of this issue of deflation. You know, I look in the book at when markets are expensive and when they come down. And the conclusion is if, if the reason they get expensive is because we're pricing in a very low discount rate and a very high growth rate. In other words, the market's saying there's not really going to be any inflation ever again. Interest rates will stay low and corporate cash flows will stay high. And if you discount that back, you get a pretty high valuation. So something has to be wrong in that equation. There's two things that could be wrong. Either you get the discount rate wrong or you get the growth rate wrong. Now, if it's a discount rate, what that means is the central bank is actually going to be attacking inflation and putting interest rates off. And the conclusion in the book is that those bear markets are very slow. But when it's a collapse in cash flows, they can happen very, very quickly indeed. So the evidence for that would be 1921, uh, 1937, 2000 to 2002. Uh, 2007, 2009, all of these happen very, very quickly because they're associated with falling corporate cash flow. And that's the market we have today. It's obvious in commodity producing companies. It's obvious in oil producing companies. I believe it's spreading elsewhere. There are some com companies that don't even have any cash flows to begin with. So as soon as the market sees that and smells that, I think that's what's been happening in 2016 then prices fall quickly. It's difficult to see this time what is going to turn that around. There's nothing to me in the imminent horizon that's going to sort of shore up faith and belief in corporate cash flows. Well, I've heard a lot of people saying that the relationship between oil prices and market performance has been severed. What do you make of that? The crucial thing about the oil price is not that it's come down enough to stimulate growth, it's come down enough to stimulate default and that's why it's important. So we have to go back a long way, but if you go back to 1982, this is exactly what happened. We had a, a, a big run-up to 82 with high oil prices, a lot of dollar debt taken on by emerging markets and oil producers, a collapse in the oil price and massive default. Now that default is probably ultimately more important than the stimulative effects of, of a falling oil price. So the first thing we have to say about this is that very occasionally, you know, the oil price has been up and down a lot since 1982 without a lot of mass bankruptcies, but this movement is big enough to constitute or create some credit event. And then the second thing is this, it was supposed to be a tax cut, the, the falling petroleum price, the falling gasoline price. Uh, but I think the demographics are very different. Uh, the baby boom generation is now aged 51 to 69. 
and it's not clear to me that they spend this so-called tax cut from lower gasoline prices. Maybe they save it, maybe they even pay off some debt. So you know, there are two things that are different of where we are today, and the oil price is having a different effect because of demographics, but also because of the excessive levels of dollar debt that were taken on by, by oil producers, and I'm thinking of countries even more than, than companies. Well, finally, overall, what do you think investors and indeed policymakers should really take away from all of this? Well, we say in Ireland is, well, you wouldn't want to start here and you really wouldn't want to start here. There's just far, far too much debt in the system. So what they want to take away from here is finding a way of growing this economy and growing the world without so much debt. There are lots of things that can be done to do that, and I know the IMF is actually talking about some of them, but even that is very painful. The cold turkey from getting some of this debt down is extremely painful, but uh, sometimes that's what's necessary. So there are no easy answers, uh, but a better form of growth with less debt uh, and more stability is, is something we're going to have to get to eventually. And as far as I'm concerned, nothing, absolutely nothing done since 2009 tackles that core problem.